still exists and it's still prevalent today among many different races and different cultures. Going back to Phyllis Wheatley, back in that day and age, these are the typical foods that they ate, corn, cornmeal, small portions of wild game and fish, bacon, beans, peas, and bread. Pretty much whatever they could find that was around. Clothing, which brings us to clothing. Um, Fashion in the northern part of America, people typically wore darker colors. They weren't really festive, whereas in the south, even in the 17th and 18th century, as you can see here, people wore lavish clothes. They were very colorful and very festive. They had a lot of parties. The life of a southern plantation owner is what you saw in movies like Gone with the Wind. There's plenty of that. Which brings us to what me and John have on right now. Um, of course, we, we did what we could with the resources we had, but slaves um, would typically wear torn or rag clothing, hand-me-downs, whatever kind of fabric they could find, they made something out of it. Phyllis, um, like I said before, Phyllis has been recorded for traveling, so the chances of her wearing rags or something like what I have on would be very unlikely. I mean, she was a reflection of her owner, so they wouldn't have her dressed in rags. Another thing I wanted to talk about was, um, and this is actually a painting or a drawing from Phyllis. Another thing I wanted to talk about is her body or her, her head piece. It was actually, um, a law in the South that black women or African American slaves, when they went out in public, that they had to cover their hair um, with a scarf, handkerchief, bonnet. Well, the bonnet is a reflection of Phyllis Wheatley and the times she lived in. I have a hat on, but you had to wear it. If you didn't wear it, you would get in trouble. She also got to meet um, the president at that current time, and that was one. That was one of the reasons, as she said. Her appearance reflected the her appearance reflected her master. So reading the text, there were di there were different races in the there are not different races in the text, however, it does speak about social injustice and slavery. No one specific race is favored over another, but some indications from researching that she thought that Caucasians had a favoritism, whereas African Americans had nothing and the table was completely <coughs> in an unfavorable state. Phyllis Wheatley wrote about her trials and experiences that she went through. Um, she's not really gender specific, um, but in that day and age, gender played a big role. If you were white and you were a male, then as John said, in that time, the tables were in your favor. Um, 
women of all colors were not allowed to vote. Um, women in general just didn't have a lot of rights, really. Um, they were not allowed to conduct any kind of business whatsoever. They were even asked to sometimes leave the room. All of this helped shape the text in which Phyllis wrote, because um, without there being a favoritism or a dominant gender or race, of course she wouldn't have the the passion to write about her oppression and her um, her being captive. Both poems are arranged in a rhythmic scheme which helps the overall effectiveness of the poem. Explaining the process is quite simple. Phyllis Wheatley had points to get across and she made that crystal clear in her writing with her hard, with her hard, harsh, and scarful tones. Phyllis Wheatley's style of writing is dark, angry, scornful, yet optimistic. <laughs> okay. This brings us to one of her poems on being brought from Africa to America, um, where she used a lot of figurative language. Um, one of the one of her stanzas that I just took and ran with was she referred to Africans as being black as cane. She also said their color is a diabolical dye. Um, due to her research of the Bible, since that was one of the things that the Wheaton family taught her and really instilled in her, um, Cain was the son of Adam and Eve. Um, he was one of two sons of, Cain well, and Abel. yeah, there was Cain and Abel. And he was known in the Bible as the first man to kill. So whereas Abel was a good or pure spirit, Cain was a black or dark spirit. And that is the way that a lot of um, people at the time, especially I would assume the people, um, both white and black workers on the slave ship, viewed these new Africans as evil or dark or just non-human in, in general. Many slaves turned to religion for inspiration. Some practiced African-American religion, including Islam, and others practiced Christianity. Most practiced a brand of Christianity, which included African elements rejected by the, by the, Christian, by the Christian masters, which justified slavery. Phyllis Wheeler died around the age of 30, Poor and, poor and alone with her newborn child that allegedly passed away a few hours after her. Um, that's all that we have for y'all. I hope y'all learned something. I, one more thing, I'm sorry. Um, okay, one thing I want to say. Although Phyllis Wheatley mentioned in a few lines on being, we were talking about the second poem, on being free from bondage. For example, in the short poem, A Lady on the Death of the Three Relations, she quotes, from bondage free, the exulting spirit flies beyond Olympus and the starry skies. I believe that she's not only talking about being free from slavery and from earth, but flying to heaven. I would also assume that Phyllis Wheatley is going beyond Olympus and to the stars will be in her mind as the highest place that she could possibly imagine. With that, we conclude our presentation.